good evening class <coughs> i think we have assembled here for knowing about the strategic revision on for anthropology as a optional now many of the students were asking me certain questions right i would probably start with those questions which are being asked then i will move into what are we going to do as part of this program in case if you don't join this program how should you plan your next 3 months for mains examination right so this is what is the next one hour that we are going to discuss fundamentally now one particular question that was being asked constantly is who should join right because there were number of questions that were raised by the aspirants and the students saying that should only a candidate who is going to qualify prelims join this particular program or should only a candidate who is having anthropology as an optional join this program or should only a candidate who has finished the foundation or who has finished one set of revision with respect to anthropology can join this program or a candidate who is yet to start the preparation for anthropology can start the can join the program now you will have to categorically understand that this program is meant for fundamentally majorly a revision program people generally call it as crash course but i don't want to be so crashing in this crash course to a larger extent now when i say this revision program what do you fundamentally understand by this revision program is sir will you be touching all the areas yes i will be touching all the areas of anthropology and you also have to categorically understand that anthropology as an optional if you observe you see that there are certain favorite topics for the examiner for example if i look at paper 1 definitely i see one question coming from either 1.2 or 1.3 one more question definitely coming from 1.8 definitely two or three questions coming from 1.5 1.6 that is primatology and archaeology and i definitely know one 2.1 and 2.2 there is one question that is society and culture civilization right cultural relativism ethnocentrism visa vis that is one favorite area that was present or i definitely know there is one question coming from religion i definitely know there will be one question coming from thought minimum anthropological thought minimum and for past 4 5 years you see that the favorite area in anthropological thought was victor turner and clifford geets victor turner and clifford geets has been one favorite area neo evolutionism has been one favorite area right although post modernism is a theory which is little typical to understand but we don't see examiner moving towards post modernism except in 2020 so definitely one question of arriving from there one question from language one question from research methodologies definitely one question from 9.4 that is chromosomal abnormalities i will definitely see one question coming from chromosomal abnormalities that is 9.4 party then i will definitely see one question coming from 9.7 ecological anthropology i will see one question coming from growth and development and i will definitely see two or three questions coming from the applications of anthropology that is 12 chapter that means what is happening is you see that there are some favorite areas for an individual who is going to give you a question paper on anthropology and if you go back and refer to 2023 question paper i had done a detailed analysis on that in that also roughly 180 to 190 out of 250 is from this favorite areas at any cost so this program is categorically meant for revision and this program will be touching upon all the areas but definitely more emphasis on whatever areas i just mentioned why because i would look into maximization of score whenever i am going to write my mains whenever i am going to write my mains that means you might be writing mains now you might be writing mains next year you might be writing mains in 2026 doesn't matter the areas do not change because this is a categorical understanding that you can have from 2013 till 2023 if it did not change for last 11 years i don't think it will change for next 3 years very simple understanding so that means who is who can attend this program an individual who is going to write mains in 2024 i would definitely recommend for this individual an individual who is confident that will be writing mains in 
an individual who is planning for attempting in 26 26 but provided this individual should have finished at least one understanding of anthropology maybe you should have finished the basic classes and once you have finished the basic classes maybe you can attend this program so one understanding about this is who is going to attend an individual who is writing 2024 an individual who is going to plan to write 2025 these two are definitely i would suggest for them for the reason that it's going to be more helpful because what is going to happen through this process is we are fundamentally going to consolidate what do you mean by consolidation sir when you talk about consolidation with respect to anthropology because when i look at anthro as a optional for me i definitely can understand that there are certain issues which generally people face. One particular issue most of the people face is archaeological anthropology. Where you struggle to remember, where you struggle to substantiate, where you struggle to value add when it comes to archaeological anthropology. Somewhere people will also struggle mostly in physical anthropology because it is one common observation that you see. That if you are learning from an individual who is teaching you good in socio-cultural, you, they might not be rendering well with respect to physical. You don't see a right balance of socio-cultural and physical anthropology that is seen with respect to paper one. So some of you might be facing an issue with respect to physical anthropology. Or some of you will also face an issue with respect to remembering the thinkers. Most of you will say, sir, I don't know who is, who is giving this particular theory. Although you know, you do not know what is the book that is being referred there. You will not be able to recollect what is the book that is being referred or you will not be able to recollect what is the nature of the field work that has been done by that particular anthropologist. Because at the end of the day when you are writing an answer in anthropology, if you are not stating the substantiated field works, it is not going to make any sense, it is definitely not going to be meaningful to a larger extent. Now these are some general issues that I generally see when it comes to paper 1. When I look at paper 2, what issues generally people face? In paper 2, you fail to understand the broader perspective of village and caste studies. If you see, if you look at paper 2, most of you think that paper 2 is very, very dynamic. Definitely it is dynamic. But don't you think if I am able to understand the broader perspective of village studies and caste studies to a larger extent, most of my dynamic parts in paper 2 will be handled. Why? Because when I look at some of the favorite areas in paper 2, just to refer, I see 1.3, ethno-archaeology, definitely some questions coming. I see 1.1, definitely with respect to archaeological anthropology. I will definitely look into 3.1, that is Varna system. I will definitely look at 3.4. I will definitely look at fourth chapter, that is one thinker always. But the beauty of UPSC is that whatever the thinker or whoever is the thinker they are asking, it is one of the repeated questions. If you look at SC Roy, SC Roy was asked in 2021. SC Roy was asked in 2023. Definite. Or if you look at NK Bose, if you look at Veena Das, if you look at Iravati Karve, all of these are some of the bunch. That means I have six to seven thinkers who are constantly repeated. If I'm able to have a notes upon them, if I'm able to have a structure among them, it's going to be easy for me to render. Now, when I look at fifth chapter, I know village study is very, very important. The dynamics of indigenous. Processes which are exi existing, exogenous processes which are existing with respect to village system. That is also one very, very important area. The minorities. Religious minorities is one important section that is seen. I also see the impact of religion or impact of different religions. I see it might be with respect to Hinduism, it might be with respect to Christianity, it might be with respect to Islam, it might be with respect to Jain. Impact of religion on Indian society, impact of religion on tribal cultures. One definite area is being asked from these two. And I definitely know from 9th chapter of paper 2, I will also have one question. Either it is role of NGO. Right? Or with respect to development of anthropology. So what I am observing or... And ethnicity is definitely one question. Ethnicity is definitely one question. Right? It might be the understanding of ethnicity. It might be types of ethnicity. Or it might be with respect to tribal movements based on ethnicity. That means most of the northeastern tribal movements are fundamentally derived by what my dear? Ethnicity. So that means when I observe these things, what do I commonly see? I see that these are some of the hotspots which are generally seen in the context of paper 2. And what kind of challenges do I face? 
is understanding the broader perspective of village and caste studies. If you ask me, sir, how do you put these things in simpler manner? I can simply tell you, any caste study, any caste study can be divided into three things. Ek to for caste, ek to against caste, and tisra kya hoga? A neutral perspective. A neutral perspective. That is beautiful. Any caste system, I see either it is for caste. We be, maybe the, on the basis of origin, maybe on the basis of the structure. If I look at G.S. Gurey's understanding of caste system where he gives six different parameters on that basis. Now in that context, what I am understanding? For it, against it, a neutral perspective. And when I look at any village study, what is my fundamental understanding in village study? Either I consider village study to be a self-sufficient unit where I talk about cosmopolitan where I talk about little republics that means where I see that it is self-sustaining unit I also see that either it is interdependent unit either it is independent or either it is interdependent and what is my third view that is a neutral perspective which is having a balance or a mixture of both interdependent and independent now don't you think I can simplify my understanding and I will be able to answer better when I know some three caste, three caste studies for, three caste studies against and three caste studies neutral. I can definitely write this. Now what is happening my dear because at the end of the day I see caste as a dynamic phenomena, caste in politics, caste conflicts, caste as a unit of division, caste as a structural entity, origin of caste. These are the five perspectives that I see generally from the caste system being asked. Nothing more, nothing beyond. Now when I look at the village system, what is going to happen? Village as a self-sufficient unit, village as an interdependent unit. And more than anything, I see what? The indigenous and exogenous processes which are happening with respect to the village system. It might be Sanskritization process. It might be universalization and parochialization process. It might be orthogonal or the, the heterodox kind of transitions that is happening with respect to this. So what is happening is I observe that if I am able to classify all of these studies into these three brackets, it is very very easy to remember. It is very very easy to remember in this context. So one major challenge do I face is clear understanding of caste and village studies. The second major issue that I find is I will not be able to search for case studies. Because people say and the worst, I mean I would say it is blessing but I would say it, was, it is curse also because Paper 2 can be written like a general studies paper. If you understand Indian society, if you know Indian society well, you can write beautifully paper 2. But the problem is, you think you have written it beautifully, but the examiner will not give you marks. So in that context, what you have to understand? That every statement that I state, every theory that I state, every observation that I put in, I need to substantiate using case studies. Now one fundamental doubt might arise, sir, everybody is referring to same source. Some ready-made question-answer format, right? It might be demystified, it might be simplified, whatever format that you are, it might be complete, whatever you are referring, that might be your own perspective. But in that context, what you have to understand is, sir, how is my answer going to stand out? The simplest way to keep your answer stand out in this, in this process is updating the case studies which you are going to refer, which you are going to substantiate when you are writing an answer. Now, will you sit down and read research articles? Do you have time to sit down and read research articles? Definitely not. Definitely not. Now, most of you will again have a very, very big problem that how am I going to substantiate my answer vis-a-vis -vis usage of case studies? Most of you will have an inorganic way of incorporating. Just because you are supposed to write, you will write. That's a problem. But fundamentally, you have to understand the organic incorporation of these case studies is what is very, very important. Because for example, if I am talking about the issues of tribes, if I am talking about issues of tribal women, for example, last year you see there was one specific question in paper 2 which was asked, what are the issues that are being faced by the women because of development induced displacement or due to dam structures? What do you understand that there unless and until I have some good case studies, I will have to keep on writing the same case studies of Nagarjun Sagar and Chenchus on that particular aspect. That is going to be a problem for me. So unless and until I am going to have a bunch of case studies and unless and until I learn how to incorporate them, paper 2 is not going to be an easy way. The third major issue that I see in the context of paper 2 to a larger extent 
is there are some grey areas where I don't know what to write. For example, tribe nation state. In 2019, there was one question which was asked on tribe nation state. Now there, we will have to read volumes of things or voluminous material for us to write one answer. Now in that context, don't you think if I keep five countries, maybe US, definitely, Russia, Australia, some African nation and India. Finish. Because tribe nation state, that means how is the understanding of the tribe with respect to that nation state set up that is existing. And how is the treatment, how is that engagement that is existing between state and the tribe and the nation and the tribe. When I am able to have that coordinate, when I am able to have that organic content that is existing with me, I will definitely be able to write better when I am writing these grey areas. Ethno-archaeology is a grey area. Although ethno-archaeology is a repeated question, the maximum that you will have is what one flowchart that is given, one definition, but what about the case studies? If the same case studies again you will use that Naga's thunderbolt concept you will use. Right? But don't you think you are not going to refer your MLK Murthy's understanding of ethno-archaeology? Unless and until I bring in this perspective of Indian anthropologists when I am writing certain grey areas like this, it's going to be very difficult. For example, ethnicity. Now when you look at ethnicity, if I am going to give you a 10 marker or a 15 marker on ethnicity, how many of you will write? That's a very very big question mark that is existing. Now there we will have to look at what are the perspectives that were seen, what were the theories behind ethnicity. Now those things will have to be discussed to a larger extent. Unless and until I discuss those, I will not be able to write an answer on ethnicity. So that means grey areas is one major issue that I see in paper 2. Now these are the two, these are the issues which generally you find in anthropology as a paper. Now in that context, sir, how are we going to handle these things? Or before, how are we going to structure the course? What is supposed to be done with respect to anthropology when you are writing an answer? Now when you look at what is the general understanding when I write an answer, I will tell you some misconceptions or I will tell you some myths first. Then I will tell you the right structure for writing an answer when you talk about anthropology. When you look at myths, the first and foremost myth that comes when I am writing an answer is load it with thinkers. The examiner will not understand whether you are writing an answer or whether you are writing a textbook. Load it with thinkers, they will say. Oh, beautiful. We will see that is one myth. The second myth that is existing in the context of anthropology is loaded with the diagrams. The relevant diagram, the relevance is, forget about relevance, loaded with diagrams. The third thing that is mostly seen with respect to the myths in anthropology answer writing, especially when I am writing paper 2, they say load it with examples. This is in the context of paper 2. This is one common area that I keep listening to. That I keep listening to. But you will have to fundamentally understand that anything that is too much is too bad. That is what is my simple understanding that I have been learning from Bachman say. Now in this context, what constitutes a right way of writing an answer in the context of anthropology? Now you have to categorically understand Writing an answer for paper 1 and writing an answer for paper 2, both are very different. They are very different. Both are very different for the reason that this fundamentally talks about theoretical aspects of anthropology. This fundamentally talks about theoretical aspects of anthropology and unless and until I bring in a theoretical perspective with a strong conceptual clarity, with a strong conceptual clarity, I am not going to write an answer which is going to be awarded marks in the context of paper 1. Because I see paper 1 gives me a theoretical understanding. And I will have to talk about those theoretical understandings from different dimensions. That means the next necessity that I would see is diversify. Diversify. Now for example last year we see one question was there with respect to race and ethnicity. Now everybody was talking about race and ethnicity had common elements, convergent elements but how are you supposed to look at that particular perspective? Of that particular perspective when I see race and ethnicity don't you think I will have three perspectives here? 
One perspective is race versus ethnicity. One perspective is convergence of race and ethnicity. And I will also see what are the common elements that are existing with respect to race and ethnicity. Now here what is happening is don't you think when I want to build my content, when I want to remember certain things, it's very very easy if I remember in this partition the perspectives. It's easy. For example, last year they were asking you about regulations, marriage regulations and vis-a-vis, -vis, how is it engaging the social solidarity. Now in that context, rules and regulations, unless and until you are able to talk about certain perspectives, you have to say that that might be with respect to exogamy, that might be with respect to endogamy, that might be with respect to hypergamy, that might be with, re with respect to hypogamy, that might be with respect to incest taboo. Many people will restrict up to this point. But what about the systems of exchange that you are supposed to discuss? The systems of exchange, that is cross cousin, parallel cousin, uncle niece, these are also part of the system, these are also rules and regulations which are existing. Because I know that in South Indian systems I can definitely go for parallel cousin marriages. But that is not seen in the context of Northern India. That is where you see Iravati Karva study of kinship varying in that context. So here you have to fundamentally understand that unless and until I diversify my answer, I am not going to get marks. And diversification does not mean jabardasti. Because in general studies, I know if I want to diversify, I will simply use special approach, political, economic, social, technological, legal, whatever, ethical, environmental. That is what is my diversification in general studies. But what structure will I use in anthropology? That is one fundamental question that you will have to understand. Right? Because theoretical understanding will demand a way of writing with diversification. Diversification. And one more thing that I will have to see is, I will have to left and right use anthropological thought. Anthropological thought. Because I know that when I understand the sixth unit that is anthropological thought, be it the classical evolutionist theory, be it neo-evolutionism, be it structuralism, be it cultural functionalism, be it structural functionalism or be it your your postmodernism, or be it your cultural materialism or be it your historical particularism any of this theory that is existing in 6th chapter will have relevance with respect to all of the chapters of socio-cultural don't you think so? definitely yes when I look at incest taboo as a topic when I look at incest taboo as a topic I will have to look at the structural perspective of incest taboo the functional perspective of incest taboo the evolutionary perspective of incest taboo the psychological perspective of incest taboo what Malinowski says? Malinowski says that familiarity breeds a contempt. Functionalist perspective of incest tab. Unless and until I understand these perspectives, unless and until I bring in these five different perspectives, I am not going to write an answer on incest tab. They say magic. They say rituals. Now you look at your these concepts of the practitioners, religious practitioners. You look at marriage payments. You look at the impact of globalization on indigenous communities. All of these are some of the grey areas which are existing in paper one as well. And for unfortunately, these are some of the important areas in paper one. You look at globalization, impact of globalization on indigenous communities, you have it being asked in 2019. Again you have it being asked last year. Every year when I see this repetition of questions, it becomes an imperative on us to understand what is going on with the subject. And when I am writing physical anthropology, please understand, I will have to explain the concept, one, and not only explain the concept, I will have to bring in the biocultural approach when I am writing the physical aspect. And not only the biocultural aspect, but I also I will have to look at the social relevance of that particular concept. Most of us, what do they do? Most of us, if I say, if I am writing an answer on physical anthropology, I will restrict my answer to physical anthropology. Now, when they ask you, what are the methods of studying growth and development? You say, cross-sectional method, longitudinal method, mixed method. But are you bringing in the perspective of cultural aspect here? Are you bringing in the aspect of primary socialization? Don't you think, understanding the studies or with this studies you will be able to better understand growth and development which is enriching the socialization process. That is what you study in 2.1 and 2.2 with respect to society and culture. So that means what you have to understand. Don't you think I can bring in the perspectives of tribal health issues in this context? 
Are you understanding? That means what am I doing is the crux of answer writing in anthropology is interlink. What am I going to interlink? I will have to interlink paper 1 and paper 2 beautifully. I will have to interlink socio-cultural as well as physical anthropology. I will have to interlink archaeological and physical anthropology. I will have to interlink socio-cultural and archaeological anthropology. Are you understanding? Interlinking does not mean randomly putting in, but I need an organic flow. I need an organic flow. But when it comes to paper 2, when I want to understand what is the way of writing in paper 2, you will have to categorically understand that in paper 2, I will have to bring in the concepts of paper, paper 1 at any cost. Now in case in 2021, if you observe paper 2, they would have asked you, what are the factors for high population in India? Now when they say high population in India, it is fundamentally a question from the second chapter. That is the demographics. Now when it is asking about demographics, if you are not talking about demographic theories in paper 1, it is sin. It is sin. Why? Because that is the anthropological perspective. If I don't write those anthropological theories with respect to the demographic theories, I am not going to look into these issues. Now for example, in 2018 there was one question with respect to the psychological, the social and physical issues of aging. Beautiful. Everybody will write those issues of aging. You don't need to study anthropology for writing the issues of aging. If I observe my grandfather or grandmother, I will be able to write better. But don't you think I will have to bring in the theories of aging here? I will have to bring in the biological theories, the socio-cultural theories, the psychological theories that are existing with respect to aging. Now please understand this is what is going to be a very big challenge when it comes to your writing and writing an answer in anthropology. So in paper 2, I will have to bring in paper 1 concepts. In paper 2, you also have to understand, I will have to go for thematic discussion to a certain extent. Now, for example, last year, if you observe, there was one question with respect to G.S. GS Gure's perspective on what? Tribes as backward Hindus. G.S. Gure's, GS Gure's perspective on tribes as backward Hindus. Now, in that context, when I talk about backward Hindus, now here, so many people were writing about the issues of tribes and saying that it is backward Hindus. Is it so? Is it the way you write? No. You will have to bring in the perspective there of what? The approaches of Protection with respect to tribal section, the integrationist perspective, the assimilationist perspective, the isolationist perspective. Now the counter to the isolationist perspective was assimilationist aspect, perspective. And in assimilation who was there? G.S. Gure was there. And in the context of assimilation they talked about backward Hindus. That means what? Assimilation as a phenomena. You will have to bring in the concept of N.K. Bose here. Just because they asked you about G.S. Gure, you can't write about other thinkers, you will have to bring in because there are other people who are supporting this theory. What is N.K. Bose theory? N.K. Bose when he is studying the Juan tribe of Odisha, he talks about tribal absorption in Hindus. Tribal absorption in Hindus, that means how is the culture of the tribal sections of the society were subsumed by the Hindu culture. That is what is one perspective that we will definitely have to bring in here. And from there talk about the issues, from there talk about the approaches to conserve one. Definitely we can conclude that particular answer with the understanding of tribal panchashil. Requirement of national tribal policy. Although we have the draft, we have to talk about the national tribal policy. That means that is a question which is talking about the fourth chapter in paper 2. And also it is talking about 6.2 in paper 2. And also it is talking about what? The ninth chapter of paper 2. Are you understanding? That means what is happening? The examiner in his, in his questioning or her questioning, they are ensuring that there is an interlinkage which is existing in the question paper. Why are we not interlinking? And that is a perspective, that is a reason why you will have to understand thematic discussions to be present there. And any given day, the narrative which goes on in the market is what, my dear, your examples and case studies. Does your examples and case studies means dumping your answer with examples and case studies? Your thematic discussion to be substantiated. Your case study should not become the answer. The thematic discussion should be substantiated by case studies. Please understand this. 
So what does a right component or what is a right way of writing an answer? This is what is general perspective after talking to so many individuals. And after as an individual personally following it, I can tell you this is what is a better way of writing definitely. Now once I understand this, sir, how are we going to build this over this particular course called strategic revision program? Now when we see how are we going to build this, I see that each, when I look at the program details of strategic revision program for anthropology, I am going to conduct lectures of 3 hours. I am going to conduct lectures of 3 hours on an average and we are going to have 20 such sessions. Sir, why only 20 sessions? Because it is revision program. If I take anything more, it will become normal classroom program. Pointless. Right? 20. How many hours? 60 hours. Is it sufficient to revise? More than sufficient. Why? Because we are going to consolidate, not go for a detailed discussion. Now what are we going to do in this? Is, how is it going to be divided? These 20 sessions are divided as 5 each. 5 each. 5 for section A, 5 for section B, 5 for paper 2 section A, 5 for paper 2 section B. Because here I am not going for uneven division because once upon a time we used to have such that whole section, whole part B used to be physical, whole part A used to be socio-cultural. You pick up, you choose one section well and you will be able to write. But now they are mixing. We don't have that particular choice which is present at this moment. They are mixing all of this. Now when they are mixing all of this, what is my perspective? I will have to be ready equally with all of this. Now how is this lecture going to be each lecture? How is it going to be present? Now when I look at this three hours, for suppose say if I am picking up sixth chapter, that is sixth chapter of paper one is anthropological thought. Now, if I am picking up anthropological thought, my first focus would be what? PYQs. When I ransack the PYQs, I have segregated PYQs of last 40 years. Right? When I ransack the PYQs of 40 years, for me, six questions are very important from this sixth chapter. First, I would finish those six questions. Sir, what do you mean by finishing those six questions, sir? I would say, for that particular topic, I will be ready with intros. Right? I will have a common intro for anthropological thought. I can have a common, common conclusion for anthropological thought. It is only the thinkers and the theories will change in middle. And I will see that there is a specific structure which is going to exist when I am writing a answer on 6th chapter. What is that? I would see what is the theory about. I would see what is the field work that was done. I would see what are the observations and I would see what is the significance and I would see what is the criticism. Do I need to write anything more? No. And more than anything when I am talking about all of this, I would give you a general perspective on structuralism for suppose. Now when I ask you structuralism, under pressure if you are unable to recollect something, how are you going to handle this question? That's going to be a problem. Because in anthropological thought, one biggest problem would be to recollect their fieldworks, to, to recollect their observations. And for example, if you pick up some school like Culture Personality School, you don't know whether Ruth Benedict or Margaret Mead, what, have the, what, what did they say? You don't know whether they were saying that the culture determining the personality or personality determining the culture. In exam, we are confused. But I definitely know Abraham Cardinal. Right? Those people will fundamentally talk about the reciprocal relation that is existing with Ralph Linton, Abraham Gardner. You will see that these people fundamentally talk about the interdependence of culture and personality. Cora, Dubois, these three. But in the first, I have a confusion. So in that context, we will have to have a broader perspective. When I say structuralism of Lévi-Strauss, I definitely see what? Lévi-Strauss was more focused on the structure of the society. It might be with respect to structure of religion, it might be structure of marriage, it might be structure of kinship. That is where you see, no? That the Lévi-Strauss understanding of kinship and R.C. Brown understanding of kinship. The difference. Descent theory and alliance theory. 
Because that is the structural perspective of the Levistras which has been applied to kinship. Now what is the broader perspective of Levistras structuralism? I see that any society will have a structure. Any society will definitely have a structure and when you observe the structure, structure will have two different parts. One is the deep structure, the other one is the surface structure. And what he says? That he says that if you have to understand the structure of the society, I will have to understand the deep structure of the society. And how should I understand the deep structure of the society? By understanding the surface structure of the society, I will enter through understand deep structure of the society. And he also says that, that the society's the surface structure might be different. But the deep structures of the society will be very very similar. And don't you think this is very very similar to the psychic unity of mankind theory that was given by the classical evolutionists. If I remember this much, my structuralism is over. The only thing, one more thing that you will have to remember is what were the models that was used by Levi-Strauss. Are you understanding? Under pressure, don't I think I will be able to recollect this? In five minutes, we will revise the concept. Then immediately we will get into the structural analysis of all of these dimensions. Intros, conclusions, the theory, the field work. And when we do, when we write about these, one more challenge that we generally face is we will stick to only the thinker whom we are writing. Here we will have to look at the counter views, if at all they are there. And also we will have to look at is somebody who was supporting this theory. For example, last year when you look at the criticism of criticism of Malinowski. Malinowski and Margaret Mead, they had asked one 20 marker last year. The criticism. Now when you look at that criticism, what do you see, my dear? Most of us don't know Derek Freeman. Most of us don't know Derek Freeman. He completely has done his field studies on countering Margaret Mead. His field study was opposing Margaret Mead. And Malinowski's criticism was what? Although outside we consider Malinowski to be the father of the participant observation, he was the one who has revolutionized the research methodologies in the context of anthropology. But the problem with Malinowski is what? He was not empathetic with the individuals where he was in, staying with. The Throbiand Islanders. Are we understanding? That, that means we will have to look at these different perspectives when we talk about theory. As just an example. Now first suppose say religion. Religion in PYQs PVS, PVS, if you look. Three questions very important. Ek to approaches to religion. Last year also we had the anthropological approach versus psychological approach. Now here many people, many individuals got confused. Sir, anthropological approach itself is psychological approach. Beautiful my dear. But a smart individual will definitely think about what? Evolutionary approach versus psychological approach. Functional approach versus psychological approach. I can build an answer. I can build an answer because I know these three are the approaches which are existing. If I still want to bring in, I will bring in structural approach of religion. I can bring in structural approach of religion. If I want, I can still bring in symbolic approach of religion. What was Victor Turner's Endembo Society? That your Clifford Geats, your Bali's cockfight, all of these are what matter? Perspectives that I can bring in. I can bring in the perspective of rights the passage, concept of liminality, those dimensions. Are you understanding this? Right? So we would pick up those hot spots first with respect to that particular chapter, then look at the other questions. Other question. So we will handle, how are we going to do? We will handle set of introductions, set of conclusions, set of field work, set of case studies, set of thinkers and set of the books that are supposed to be remembered for that particular individual. And once I have that consolidated notes, do you think my revision material is ready? My revision material is ready. The content that you will fill is based on my explanation. You already have some understanding. And when you already have some understanding, you will see that the conceptual clarity will be opened up by me. I will open up the conceptual clarity. You will fill the content according to the question that is asked. When I look at language, 90% of the aspirants will not be able to build content of the social context of language. Because the set, mark, the set material in the market will talk about only limited perspective. They would never bring in the perspective of Pitgin and Creole when you are writing the social context of language. Please understand. So that means we will have to look into what are the mandatory components that are to be present when you are writing a particular topic. They will have to be there. I will lay up with the, why will I get that? 
Why will the examiner be giving you? Because at the end of the day, you have to understand, examiner will only search for those things which are mandatorily supposed to be there in an answer. You are there, your base marks are ready. Your base marks are ready. And when you are putting in those components, I will be identifying, I will be telling, I will be throwing, I will be giving those mandatory components to be involved when you are writing an answer. And if you were supposed to do all of this on your own, it will take six more months. Now rather than that, I am telling you, I will finish all of those in 60 hours. Right? Now, how is the class spaced? That it is starting on 7th. July 7th, which is a Sunday, Monday. It's a Sunday, I think, on Monday. It's a Sunday. July 7th is a Sunday. Right? Our classes will be on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Four days classes, two days, three days revision and towards the end of that week you will be writing test. That means what my focus is finishing anthropology as fast as possible. Because some option like anthropology is what the beauty of this is I can revise it five times before I enter exam. I don't think I can, the other options will have this advantage. Because I know what is to be written, I know the hotspots, I know at least 180 to 190 will be repeated from PYQs. Definite. So what will I do? I will revise. Right? I will revise. So Thursday, Friday you revise. Saturday you revise. Saturday afternoon you will write the test. Again we will start our class on Sunday. The explanation for this test will be conducted on Sunday afternoon. We are going to have morning sessions of classes. We are going to have morning sessions. Generally, I am thinking 10 to 1. So that everything is consolidated at a point. It is not that I am not giving you time to revise. It is not that you are randomly coming and writing the test. It is a structured program which has been taught out. And if I follow this, don't you think, my optional will be over in how much, my dear? Five weeks. Five weeks. If I am starting it on July 7th, one month is August 7th, then by at any cost, by August 11th, I will be finishing whole of my anthropology. With value addition, with tests, with one-to-one -one mentorship, with evaluations, with the suggestions, with introductions, with conclusions, with ready-made field works, with ready-made thinkers. Don't you think it is a program which has been truly designed on Indian mentality? What is Indian mentality? Put less, get more. And then that is what is my perspective. I will put in 60 hours of my hard work, I will consolidate whole of my anthropology and I will take care of the things. Yes or no? Because all of the PYQs have been written, they are ready. All of the case studies have been compiled, they are ready. It's only that I will have to do little more tinkering here and there. And when I give you all of those, you are ready with your optional in 5 weeks. And in this, you, some people might be having, sir, I am not writing tests. Why are you not writing tests? We have 4 sectional tests. After every section is over, we are writing test. Are we writing test randomly or after revising we are writing? After revising we are writing. And automatically when I finish these four sections, then it will be followed by a full length test. And this test will be, will I be giving you solutions or will I be giving you explanation? Explanation. We will have a separate explanation class on this. That would be roughly around three to three and a half hours. Because that is required. When I see some dynamic questions, for example, glottochronology. Glottochronology, so many of you left, in case if you have written. But don't you think if you would have seen the Hindi translation, it talked about bhasha. In the Hindi translation, there was bhasha. Bhasha means something which is related to linguistic anthropology. But the beauty was, I even had notes on glottochronology as part of historical linguistics. That means from when I have been preparing my notes? From 2016. In 2020, there was one question on liminality. People were perplexed. 
But I had the notes on liminality. Look at the diversified sources of the material that I have referred to. It's all ready. It's all ready. It's only that I will have to give it to you. We will have to execute and we will have to revise, write, practice and then maximize the score. Because anthropology is such an optional that which will never ditch you. It will never leave you on go. You respect it. It will even give you festival offer sometimes. It will even give you some festival offer. Right? You are you have prepared with these hot spots and you were arriving at 240, 250. Sometimes when you write something additional, suddenly out of magic, your scores turns up to be 270, 280. Now anthropology is such optional where I can definitely reach. 270 minimum guarantee provided I am supposed to put in those things which I am supposed to put which I'm, which is required for that particular answer to be written unless and until unless and until what unless and until I have these things it is not going to be easy because there are people whom you see in anthropology who get 180 and in this the biggest culprit will be paper 1 one common observation that I have been seeing across the experience, people score good in paper 2 for some reason. But they don't score well in paper 1. Right? For people getting 130, 140 in paper 2, they are like it's a cakewalk for them, they say. But paper 1, after 110, they don't cross. After 110, they don't cross. It's a problem. Are you understanding? Are you understanding? That means there were days where I have seen 151 in paper 1. Yes. Now don't you think with 151 in paper 1 with your expertise or with your jugad in paper 2 of 130, what is my score standing up to? 280. Sufficient to get a rank? Definitely sufficient. Because we will have to understand what is to be written, what is not to be written. That's very important in Antra. For example, last year, humanization process. Humanization process, people thought they will have to write skeletal changes due to erect posture. Now you have to fundamentally put a question that the humanization process, was it only with respect to the skeletal posture? Was it only with respect to bipedalism? Or was it also something with respect to a dentition? Was it also with respect to a non-honing chewing? Because you have to understand when I bring in the bio-cultural perspective, I see that bipedal structure as well as the invention of fire. Fire means cooked food. Cooked food means what? I need lesser robust dentition to be present and my digestive system started changing. I will have to bring in these perspectives. Otherwise, if I keep on writing bipedal structure, skeletal changes, vertebral column, foramen magnum, linea aspera, the pelvic girdle changing, then I see the median arch emerging. All this have to be written, but that is only one part of the answer. The other part is you will have to focus on the skull, the facial skull, the dentition dimension. And will I restrict my hominization process only to physiological changes? No, I will have to bring in the cultural changes because I know that biology goes hands in hand with culture and culture goes hand in hand with biology. When you are writing ecological anthropology 9.7, what do you do? All of you will write the adaptive features. All of you will write the adaptive features. You will write the adaptive features with respect to your the respiratory system, with respect to your circulatory system, with respect to your, your physiological systems. But none of you would mention the cultural adaptations when it comes to this picture. Because I will have to bring in the perspective of what? Factors of growth. What are factors of growth? Genetic factor. I will have to bring in here. Genetic factor. Sometimes in cold areas, I see thrifty gene developing to a larger extent. James O'Neill's concept of thrifty gene. Sometimes I will have to bring in the cultural dimension. Sometimes I will have to bring in the environmental dimension. Are you understanding? Sometimes I will have to bring in the nutritional dimension. Because when I see the people staying in the polar region, they chew a leaf of a particular plant to generate heat within the body. Nutritional dimension. Where am I drawing these structures? I am fundamentally drawing these structures from the syllabus itself. I maintain the structures of the syllabus, I will derive marks. And what kind of anthropological thought I can relate it to ecological anthropology? The bio-cultural the bio adaptations of solids and service. 
and i will also talk about the culture ecology approach of julian h stewart don't you think you are thinking only adaptations to be written but i am also saying right adaptations but i will bring in the conceptual clarity with respect to whole of this process of ecological anthropology was on the basis of culture ecology approach when i am writing about typo tools typo technologies in paleolithic or neolithic or mesolithic do you think i will have to bring in the cultural changes i will have to bring in the culture energy approach lesly alvin why its culture energy approach unless and until i bring in this culture energy approach i will not be able to give a perspective because over a period of time the lifestyle started changing are you understanding that dynamism in answer writing will depend upon all of this if i don't bring in this dynamism what is going to happen i am not going to score well are you getting this so we will look at this conceptual interlinkages with all of these concepts case studies field works where are they supposed to be incorporated we will discuss right so this is with respect to this particular course we are going to finish it by tentatively by august 11th maximum by august 15th including your tests including your revision classes and the evaluation will be done by me that there is nobody else who is going to evaluate i will only evaluate the paper and we will look at the improvements that are supposed to be seen when it comes to each of the answer that you are writing right so this is with respect to this particular session if you have some questions to be asked you can ask i can clarify so i think those who can join is very clear in this those who can join is very clear somebody who is writing mains in 24 and somebody who is planning to write mains in 25 everybody will plan to write mains in 25 why will somebody not plan right definitely not clearing prelims this year is not the end of it you will have to take it as a blessing in disguise because you got time to prepare for next year mains because there are people who have cleared prelims once but who got all india 44 who got final rank so you will have to see that you will have to see that that means if you have to get into the final selection you will have to be ready for mains so for those individuals who have done your basic classes of anthropology you can definitely pick up this because this is where i don't think you would have got this perspectives of interlinkage in your regular classes right this is an exam oriented approach that is to be seen in the strategic revision right it is definitely going to stand with its name strategic at any cost right if you have some questions if you have some doubts i am more than happy to address hope you got the perspective of this particular session or course ah uh, but if you have some questions online offline everything should be ready made indian mentality ah uh, definitely <laughs> that is what we are coming up with right any other any questions that you would want to ask what did i make it so clear that everything is clear huh? anything else we are starting the course on july 7th at any cost right july 7th at any cost will be starting the course okay what about strategic timings uh, are you asking about gs my dear or is it anthro lakshman is it gs that is in the afternoon gs strategic revision is in the afternoon right so this we are going to have in the morning because my target is what if i have to generally plan means if i was in your position i would want to finish whole of my cycle of anthropology whole of my cycle of gs by august 20th at any cost i would want to finish by august 20th why because from august 20th till september 20th i would focus on revisions because there i can definitely have at least two cycles of revision and immediately after my ethics i would take rest on that day next day from next day onwards i will have the third cycle of revision for optional and anthropology is such that i can revise twice in that gap that actually gives you that scope if you have this things consolidated otherwise it's a problem otherwise it's a problem right so any other online megan levama it's clear 
How many are thinking that you will write mains this year? Border? You are on border? No? Achha. Thik hai. Lez. Okay. Mirma? No? Not very sure. On border? Take there. Thik hai. Thik hai. Right? So, I think if if there are, sir, uh, we may have how many pages consolidated notes? In total, I would see maximum for both the papers 200 pages. I would not go for anything more than that. Why would I go? Then revision notes ananga See, my target is per section 30 40 pages. That's it. Because my target is what? Not the gap between ethics and language papers. My target is after language paper and before optional paper. I write language papers, right? 9 to 12, 2 to 5. I come back. Now when I come back afternoon, you know you write English. 90% of the aspirants finish it fast, take rest and come back. Now, I should be able to revise my notes within that time. That means, after the consolidated notes that we discuss in the class, you will be able to make those things of 10 pages, 10 pages, where I will be able to revise just the night before. And even though you have 30 pages, you can happily revise. You can happily revise. That is what is the target, right? Please understand. Okay. So, that is what is my target. Nothing more, 30, 35 pages. Nothing more. Right, wherever it is required, I will substantiate it with my notes. I would give you a Xerox copy of it. You can take, you can circulate a, maybe a PDF of it. Wherever it is required, wherever you think there's a, there are, there's a, uh, there are like grey areas which are existing, probably as and when it is required, I would substantiate it with notes. Right. GS class timings is in the afternoon. That's what I told. GS strategic revision is in the afternoon. Anthropology strategic revision is in the morning. Right? Three hours per day, four days a week, two days of revision, two and a half days of revision, half day of test. And next day we will have in the morning our class and somewhere in the evening we will have the test explanation of the previous. Such that our answer structures are also ready when I am seeing some question. That is more important. Right? So anything else? Others? Online? So if nothing is there, right? That's it from my side. Hope to see all of you in the class. Okay. Thank you.